We have the fantastic opportunity to speak with a geneticist, Dr. Xu Jin Luo, and she is talking to us from China. Is that correct? Yes. Well, in Beijing. That is fantastic. Uh, and uh, we have many members of the International Cat Association in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, who are cat lovers, and they are going to be as they're joining the rest of the cat lovers around the world. We're very excited about your work. Um, you have an upcoming uh, journal article that will be published that you found genetic evidence of introgression of the Chinese mountain cat as part of the domestic cat species. Tell us, how did this, why did you even look? Okay. So thank you. It's really a pressure to get you interesting and to know that people are interested in our study and interested in cats as all our favorite subject, of course. <laughs> so, uh, so let me tell you about the, so yeah, I think I remember we start with the email um, interviews. I said, like, I can, I can answer your questions in your email. So after I finished, like, by, by the time I finished the second of your, like, eight questions, I end up, like, typing and typing and I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop here. Let's schedule a talk. And I, there's just so much that I can, I can talk about it. So I, I say uh, uh, a Zoom interview will be better. Um, so, uh, so I did my PhD in in US uh, in National Cancer Institute in Maryland. So our lab has been uh, devoted to cat study, domestic cat and uh, wild cat. So and my my studies in during my PhD and postdoc was about uh, the Asian cats, the tiger, a leopard cat, and uh, marble cat. Go Asiatic golden cat, so all about Asian cat. So since I returned to China in 2009, so I, I, I really want to like, use what I've learned and what I've been trained to, to, to study all these understudy cats in China. And uh, Chinese mountain cat is, of course, is one of my favorite. It's the only known the, wild cat species in, that is endemic, that only distributed in China. And uh, it's, it's mysterious and uh, nobody knows how many are there and they, because they, they live in the um, high plateau, the Tibet, Qinghai Tibet plateau, in Northwest China. So everything like, is unknown and, and, and Tibet is always a, a place that I've been so fond of and I want to study there and a cat and then there's a, this mysterious cat that is so understudy so I really want to learn about it. And then another issue is about the domestic cat in China. So the, the, the most comprehensive genetic study of about the genetics origin of domestic cats in it's published in Science 2007 by my mm -hmm. colleagues uh, Carlos Driscoll and, uh, and Stephen O'Brien my colleagues back in NCI in Maryland so the study is very comprehensive and proving that domestic cat worldwide is derived from the African uh, wild cat uh, Felis uh, Sylvester's libica in in Near East so but the study uh, has a sampling gap that is without representation mm -hmm. from uh, from East Asia, and uh, East Asia, including China, is such a domestication hotspot. So it's uh, and and the domestic dog has a has still under debate whether it's a single domestication center or versus multiple domestication center. So China has been one of the domestication center for domestic dogs and it's still under debate. Uh, and, uh, so would the same thing happens in cats? Like uh, would the wild cat in China mm -hmm. has ever contributed to the gene pool of domestic cats in China during the domestication process? So that's something that we're really interested to explore because there's uh, the, all this um, anecdotal evidence mm -hmm. uh, saying that we have a really local uh, Chinese cat breed. It was once recognized as a as a CFA. That's breed. right, the Chinese yeah, Li, Li Hua. Li Hua, yeah. But I, I somehow 
later it was removed or uh, was not recognized or something. I, I forgot what's the story, but well, sorry, they, didn't, they didn't get enough um, engagement and bring enough cats for the judges to see and to be shown throughout the US. But uh, that mm. certainly does not diminish the fact that they were uniquely, they are a uniquely mm -hmm. beautiful cat and mm -hmm. have perhaps now one of the most interesting stories of all cat breeds thanks to your work. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so this Li Hua cat in China, so it, it has all this uh, very, yeah, uh, grassy color, tabby shape, mm -hmm. so, and immediately um, um, registered us about the, the shape and morphology of a, a, a Chinese mountain cat, also a tabby cat and a wild cat. So, so we somehow started, uh, start a cat, start a project as uh, two lines. So one is about the genetics origin and genetics composition of China, Chinese domestic cat to see, uh, to fill the sampling gap of previous uh, domestic cat study to see if there is a, if Chinese domestic cat has the same origin as the worldwide domestic cat. And the second is about the uh, uh, the Chinese mountain cat because it's a local wild cat. It's mo most uh, origin uh, local uh, wild cat. Whether it has contributed to the gene pool of local domestic cat. So and oh, so we started assembling all over China. And, um, and my student, Doctor Yu He, uh, now uh, he's a postdoc at Max. Uh, she is a postdoc at Max Planck um, Institute in Germany, and then will be returned to China to study uh, to start her faculty job at the same institute at my university, Peking University. So so during her PhD, so she she traveled around the China and collect the, to to locate the non breed cat from mm -hmm. households. So because we don't want all this uh, American short hair, British short hair, Siamese, all this, you First know, that we yeah. recently introduced to China. Mm -hmm. We really want to identify this local Li Hua cat uh, by, by morphology, of course, if that's mm -hmm. the best uh, we can guess. So to collect the, uh, the saliva, and if, at some case, we can collect the tissue samples uh, from ear and, and, the, and the blood. So, so mm -hmm. we gather around over, over 250, uh, domestic cat samples from all over China, and we sequence. Uh, we did a whole genome. We first screening with the genetics markers, and so that's a quick and we can do a larger sample. And then we pick uh, the representative sample to do a whole genome sequencing, so that we can compare with the worldwide uh, domestic cat uh, uh, data available so in the public domain. And on the and the, we also travel to Tibet and and northwest China to in and in the in the region that where the Chinese mountain cat is endemic too. So so and then also during the Tibetan village, yeah, uh, we also found uh, uh, the local uh, house cat. So we collect uh, both uh, both the. Uh, Chinese mountain cat because of the local village they will encounter row kill of the wild cat so and and, wow. and sometimes they have some old skin so so we we'll just travel around uh, in Qinghai, Tibet, Sichuan and Gansu and so even though we, we we didn't get a chance to see a Chinese mountain cat in the real in the real the wild the mm -hmm. setting but we did get uh, uh, collect about 20, uh, 20 samples of, of Chinese mountain cat and that including into the study. Wow, and that's so fantastic. Yeah, and then also we collect the, the local house cat that live in the same landscape with the Chinese uh, mountain cat. So that's, that's all into our, the uh, con consists of the base of the study. And so- uh, I have a question for you. As you traveled around in that area, because uh, here where I live in the United States, actually in Maryland, not far from NIH. Oh, so you live in Maryland. <laughs> uh, when I was in high school, my last year of high school, I met Leslie Lyons and she was a postdoctoral fellow. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's my, my me, colleague. Yeah, she took me to um, uh, the Poolsville, uh, the location <laughs> where the cats were. Karina, Karina Pettigree. Yeah, I met yeah. some of the Asian leopard cats. I visited over several, of course, of several years, but it's a small world. But here in this world, we don't frequently um, 
hear about and don't see much about how cats live with people in other parts of the world. So it's really wonderful to hear you talk about the cats that were kept as pets with people in Tibet as part of their families. And were you surprised about that or was that something that you always knew? Oh, that's really the, the most surprising um, funding that we got from the, the study. So the first, there's a two major conclusions, maybe three. So the first major conclusion is that overall, the Chinese mountain cat has the same origin as the same ancestor with the worldwide domestic cat. So all the domestic cat is derived from Near East or uh, North, uh, uh, North African, and then, then they travel and maybe follow the people and, and, and into China. That's not very uh, far, very long ago, maybe mm -hmm. about 2000. Yeah, so that's the time that we estimate that the, the cat, domestic cat enter China and then form a domestic cat uh, population in China. So all, all this was like origin to, and train uh, domesticated from a wild cat in, in Near East and then travel uh, to China and become the Chinese local cat. So the Chinese Li Hua Mao, Li Hua cat, does, it was not uh, originated from the local wild cat. So that's the first conclusion that we, we, we have. And um, the second conclusion is that despite that the Chinese local wild cat did not uh, contribute to the gene pool of uh, uh, the, the origin of domestic cat in China, but it, it, what it happened was that uh, when the, the local do, uh, domestic cat expand their population and get into Tibet, uh, the Tibetan plateau, Tibetan people are their nomadic uh, people. So, and, and dog is their traditional uh, pet. So there's a uh, Tibetan Mastiff? Yes, yeah, so, a huge so, dog. Yeah, yeah. So that's a well-known Tibetan pet associated with the Tibetan plateau life. But cat has never been a pet associated with the nomadic uh, Tibetan uh, grazing the lifestyle. So, so the cat's arrival in Tibet is really a recent uh, uh, thing. So, so, and that's how and we didn't think about it until we, we we have got the, the results and then we realized that there is the genetics integration uh, from Chinese mountain cat to their sim, uh, sympatric local house cat in Qinghai, Tibet and Sichuan area. So, which means that when the cats uh, enter China through Silk Road 2000 years ago, then this, they started expanding their population within China. And then uh, only recently they get into the high plateau, maybe, and and then they start uh, because uh, there is still the wildcat uh, dominant landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like uh, so when there's a, it's a domestic cat coming in. So we detect that the the integration and the integration is usually because we didn't have a large sampling uh, from the wild Chinese mountain cat. So we don't know whether in the wild cat population, there is already integration from the domestic cat into the wild cat. What we have is the domestic cat uh, samples from the Tibetan area where locally there is also uh, the mountain cat, uh, Chinese mountain cat. So in this area, we always detect the genetics integration from the wild cat into the, um, the domestic cat. And uh, we date uh, the, the, the timing of the hybrid uh, admixture event. Uh, and what amazes us is that uh, the earliest, uh, the oldest uh, 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 admixture event we can we detect was actually not very far, not very uh, long ago. It's about 30, 35, gen 30 generation, 35 generation. So if you use like two years as a generation time, so that equivalent to, to 70 years ago. And 70 okay. years ago correspond to the 1950s uh, when, when there's a, there's a um, re uh, recorded uh, increase of uh, household and economic development uh, and the communication from the Han Chinese uh, to Tibetan Chinese area. So, so maybe, yeah, it's just a, uh, um, uh, it's our, uh, yeah, postulation. So that's also, 
And so that's maybe our next uh, study that to look at the anthropo anthropology um, as aspects of the cats in Tibetan area. So when, when did they ever come to whether they keep the cats in the monastery, the monastery to protect the scrolls, or it's it's kept uh, only in the in the high class lama and uh, uh, class, uh, so that it, as a pet. So definitely, it's not associated with the local grazing uh, people and the, the life lifestyle. So so when did the domestic cat came into uh, Tibetan area, and then so that they they start amateur. With the uh, with the Chinese mountain cat, so that would be something that would be really interesting to further explore. And so, from the study, we see that it's a recent arrival, and it's uh, and uh, then and the and the, um, early, the earliest uh, hybrid hybrid event we can detect from the genetics data that um, it's uh, it's about uh, seventy years ago. That corresponds to the to the economic growth and population growth in the Tibetan area. So that's a really uh, interesting funding that uh, we, we have from the study. Wow, it's really amazing. And your work on top of the work that Leslie Lyons and Carlos Driscoll have done showing that uh, cat populations often mimic people populations in terms of where they move to. When large groups of people move from one area to another that hasn't been developed, they take their cats with them, and often that's where we see the cat population from, like Madagascar, like um, in the Near Eastern cat to parts of Asia. That's really fascinating. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so what's a, a concern to us is that so so right now we detect in the in the core area where the uh, Chinese mountain cat are located, uh, that in the same village, uh, and that. Uh, we, we found that we, we collect uh, five cats from the village and all of them have a, uh, beyond more than 10% um, wow. the genetics, uh, genomics integration from um, the, the Phyllis uh, BIT from the Chinese mountain cat. Wow. And then we, although it doesn't need to be look like a Chinese mountain cat, it could be uh, just a Black cat, um, mm -hmm. orange cat, tabby cat. So, so morpholo morphology is not a reliable diagnostic. So, so I often receive pictures and showing. Okay, oh, can you tell this is a, and this is a hybrid between a Chinese mountain cat and domestic cat. And then I, I will throw them my my black and white cat. <laughs> <laughs> I say, well, can you believe that he has also a Y chromosome from what Chinese mountain cat? <laughs> so, so because morphology is only part only like maybe only one gene out of the 10,000 genes in, in the in the genome. So it's it happens to reflect in the morphology, but some change may not reflect on the on the appearance. So that's so a that, very, very good point. I think that could be you know relatable to people. I had my parents do an ancestry test and found out that uh, my dad's uh, lineage goes back to uh, England, and I certainly don't look like many people imagine English people to look, so I guess it's true for cats in Tibet as well. So, I'm um, all a melting pot now. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, it was some of the, another um, interesting uh, uncovering or uh, discovery of your work that you're publishing is that not only is um, the Chinese mountain cat, Felis sylvestris bieti, in some of the domestic cats in China, particularly Tibet, but that there have been mixtures historically between Felis sylvestris bieti and Felis sylvestris ornata. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, yes. Um, yeah, so that's what the, yeah, our Onata sample was not very big, so we got maybe four of the samples, so, so, so well, we that we, instead of waiting for more sample, we decided to just go ahead and, uh, and then did the first stage study, and then the, the study will be carried on in the future anyway. So, so the, this, the, so this, this stage, we got uh, 20 BIT and four or uh, uh, Onata and then 250 domestic cats. So, and then we detect from these uh, 20 Beatis and there's uh, maybe one third of them carry a mitochondrial lineages uh, um, represent the signature for Onata. 
so so and but uh, including one cap in the Xinyin Zoo in Qinghai, so that's a uh, appearance. Uh, so we, uh, uh, completely uh, morphologically, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a Chinese mountain cat to me. So blue eyes, uh, ear tough and tabby. Oh. So everything looks like just authentic, uh, morphologically uh, authentic uh, Chinese mountain cat. So it's not uh, from a uh, 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 misidentification. So, and then one third of our BIT samples actually carry the, the Onata mitochondria. Uh, haplotype, so that which means that it's an ancient, uh, uh, old uh, uh, introgression that uh, um, so when the when the two population uh, meet met and then happens, but still uh, later because these two these two cats has a very distinct, uh, different uh, habitat, mm -hmm. so that's why like uh, uh, the the Bieti was used to name um, Chinese desert cat, but that's totally wrong. So it doesn't live in, in desert. It lives in the, the alpine, the meadow, uh, stony um, uh, field with, uh, so it's a plateau. It's a plateau cat, alpine stepped uh, cat. But the Onata is a very, uh, that's a real desert cat, I think. So every, everything, everywhere we document the Onata, it's a have in Central Asia, Xinjiang of China. Mm -hmm. So and in China is that they, 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 uh, their distribution was divided, was se uh, separated along the Qilian Mountain. So qi, on the north of Qilian Mountain is the it's the, where the Silk Road, the ancient Silk Road, uh, located uh, a very dry and, and uh, um, desert-like habitat. Uh, and uh, south of Qilian Mountain is the Qinghai Tibet Plateau, is the high, uh, at, uh, high altitude. So, so that Qilian Mountain is where the two population, the, these two wild cats uh, segregated. So, and that also where they, they, they met. Uh, so that's ha happened. So, um, and so that's how they are. Uh, once they started to to meet uh, in the ancient times, so they they leave the uh, genetics integration signature in the genome. And uh, but but they are still have a very strong the habitat preference. So they still form uh, two uh, distinct looking uh, distinct uh, population. One is a tabby cat. One is a spotty cat. So 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 they are really like a two. Uh, equidistant uh, wild cat lineage. So that's why we in the, in the paper, so we, we propose, uh, uh, we, yeah, we support uh, Carlos' uh, uh, conclusion that uh, BIT should be recognized as a co-specific uh, uh, co of uh, Philly Sylvester's because, uh, yeah, actually we have, we, we add a sentence in our paper that uh, we don't exclude another, another possibility to if all wildcat subspecies is elevated into a species, then including Onata, uh, including Asiatic wildcat is also become a, a distinct species, then the Chinese mountain cat is also a distinct species. But if the uh, Asiatic wildcat maintain as a subspecies of Phyllis fetchers, then Yeti also uh, should be classified as a um, uh, subspecies of Phyllis investors. Uh, so that's our uh, conclusion. So it's a uh, it's equidistant uh, uh, unix taxonomically. So, but they but they are different. Uh, they are and they do have a, a hybrid zone where the their two distribution meet. Uh, so, but that will lead to uh, the taxonomy uh, community to debate. It's going to be another long debate. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I, I have to say that some of the folks that have uh, literally been where you were physically in terms of at NIH, um, yourself, Carlos, and another gentleman I happened to meet with during uh, when Nelsie took me there, Eduardo Isaac, who has uh -huh. demonstrated <laughs> that uh, there has been a hybrid zone among <laughs> South Africa, South American cats and the leopardus uh, genus, and how when they meet, um, you know, cats don't discriminate in ways that people historically have, and there will be introgression events. <laughs> no, I know. That's why I feel like, particularly with this whole genome study, we, it has so much ancient introgression. Like uh, they, the two split into species, but then they have a 
uh, admixture, but then they divide it again. So yeah. what we what we observe now, there's still two distinct uh, species, but the ancient uh, integration already happened in the past. That which means that if we we observe an ongoing admixture now. Should, yeah. should we still use the reproductive um, isolation barrier to, to distinct, um, distinguish species? So, uh, so it's really like a challenging the BSC biological species concept nowadays, particularly with all this uh, isol speciation with the gene absolutely. flow. Yeah, this process, this process that we are observing. So, so yeah, I, I kind of like the idea that uh, to, to lift um, the Asiatic wildcat into a distinct species, and so that the Chinese mountain cat is also maintain a, a maintain as a distinct species. So and because they so are that. very unique and and mm -hmm. beautiful, and you know they don't get elevated uh, quite as often uh, to awareness, so people can recognize them and and appreciate their beauty because they don't have you know the pattern of another um, Chinese species mm -hmm. like the Asian cat or uh, some of the other more flashy cats but mm. it's so interesting that they've found a way to even get into some people's homes now i promise not to take up a lot of your time but i have some very good friends among the cat uh feline enthusiast community who are impressed with your whole body of work. Not only have you, you know, been able to do this incredible work with the Chinese mountain cat and finding really cool, interesting stuff in its history, you've looked at the genomes of tigers, uh, pangolins, I think I read something about bears, um, and you found, you were part of the team that found the um, gene for Japanese bobtails. How did you do that? <laughs> oh, a short cat, a tail, a cat. So that's another thing that we are so fantastic, to, fascinated about the short tail cats. So, and that um, derived from, I'm from Guangzhou, the southern part of China, Cantonese. So oh. in our area, and there's a lot of um, uh, short king tail cats. Yeah. So, and then if, when, when we travel to Singapore, Southeast Asia, Taiwan, there are even a lot more uh, mm -hmm. king tail cats. Uh, and once the, people say that because they were, these cats were new, new uh, were fixed, fixed uh, so the, the um, when they're doing this to feral cats, so they chop their tail to show that they already <laughs> surgery. <laughs> so and then later, so I, I ask my my vet friends in Singapore, and they say nonsense. They are all natural. <laughs> so, so so that has been very interesting uh, things to me. So we study from uh, so we got this uh, a a, a short tail king tail cat from from Guangzhou, my hometown. It's just a a feral cat uh, running on it, so we adopted, and then we we got it to Beijing, and then we breed her uh, with another normal cat, uh, tail cat, uh, um, male, and then we we breed a colony. Yeah, so all this uh, thanks to uh, my experience uh, with uh, NCI with the Leslie uh, Lyons and yeah. Bill Murphy, do that at Eduardo. So all this uh, cat breeding and <laughs> the story that we have experienced when we are in Maryland. So I kind of know. Yeah, let's just uh, breed uh, breed yeah. them and aggregate the the traits so that we can map the genes that are responsible mm -hmm. for the king tail. So that's how we got this has seven and genes that are responsible for the king tail to in. In, 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 in Cantonese, uh, in South, Southern China, uh, domestic cat, uh, king tail, they're also resp uh, responsible to uh, Japanese bob tail. So that, that, that study, uh, yeah, came around the same time with Leslie Lyons' work. So, so she studies uh, the Japanese bob tail and also located to the same, uh, same genes. And we, 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 we proved that uh, it's not only responsible for the king, uh, Japanese bob tail, but also responsible to one third of the king tail cats in Southern China. And so, but there's still no no two thirds but still there's a one third of the king health in southern china cannot be uh, explained by has seven genes that means that there are additional king tail genes in that is responsible for the king tail to cat in southeast asia so with uh, one of my phd students so, so this study has not been published yet so so but he he traveled from along the 
along the from the north to south, uh, from mm -hmm. Beijing to Shanghai to 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 Guangdong and to Thailand and to Indonesia. So along so from the north to south and document uh, the 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 cat the tail uh, prevalent the short tail prevalence wow. and frequency in the feral cats all around. So so he must be be examining like over 1,000 cats and literally, yeah, you need to catch a cat, catch a cat and, and then touch the you tail touch. and see, and then categorize it as a, like a severe kink, medium kink or yeah. the minor kink. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's amazing that when, when he checked, when, when, so here in Beijing, like most of the cat are, are normal tail. So mm -hmm. there's only like occasionally maybe 1% are kink tail or short tail. So the, the, the frequency increased to 30 or 40% in, in Hong Kong, Macau, and Guangdong. And that increased to 60% in Thailand. Yeah. <laughs> and then to almost 80 to 90% in Indonesia. So almost like a majority. So I was interesting that most people didn't notice it when when they travel to Southeast Asia, particularly to Indonesia. Like almost like out of the eight cats on the street, you see there are eight out of ten cats are short tail. So wow. if you travel to the very southern part of Indonesia. So that's so so really you can see that there's increase of the short tail uh, frequency uh, as we go down to the south, uh, go down to Southeast Asia. Wow. So, so yeah. So even though we have not uh, yeah map the exact genes, so also all these cats we we test has seven test all these known genetic mutation responsible to king tail. So, and which cannot explain many of them. So that means that there's another genes that, uh, uh, yeah, in the high frequency that is responsible for the king tail in Southeast Asia domestic cats. And so wow. that's really interesting to 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 further explore that why it happens like that because it cannot be explained by adaptation selection. So so maybe it's a founder effect or so then that leads to another whole story that when the cats arrive in Southeast Asia and maybe it's a founder population that is happens to be a king short tail, king tail cats like the cats to Japan. So it like the, this anecdotal story saying uh, say that the cat, uh, Japanese cat is from China um, because by the earliest monks, Buddhism monks, uh, yeah, to transfer all these uh, um, yeah, Buddhism scrolls uh, to Japan and also in the temple, they need to protect their, uh, their paper scrolls from eaten by by rats so mm -hmm. that, that's where the cats was introduced to japan so but that at least we have some 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 stories some records uh, and but in southeast asia yeah i guess we need to wow. need more uh, social study and to explore why Absolutely. how the cats uh, enter enter southeast asia because this uh, uh, it's actually this uh, Chappelle cat so was record, um, written by Darwin in in one of, of his books about the domestic mm -hmm. animal and plant uh, variation. So yeah, it, it's recorded that uh, along in, in Southeast Asia, over like a majority of the domestic cat has this king tail, bob tail. So that's a that's a phenomenon already rec recorded two hundred years ago. So wow. like, we feel it's really? uh, interesting in that we can uh, yeah explore this now and uh, by being yeah in by being situated in Asia in China. So I really feel um and it's a such a precious opportunity that uh, I can. Uh, I can yeah do a lot of these uh, interesting studies. <laughs> wow, that's really fascinating. I'm also fascinated to know whether you know, as your student uh, was collecting, um, you know, feeling the tails of those the cats as he went down uh, from north to south. Um, <laughs> I'm assuming he was also collecting blood samples and how related are those cats uh, uh, along the coast? Whether there was um, you know some sort of commonality to uh, their uh, mitochondrial, uh, mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome and their autosomes, you know, the, the prevalence of certain colors or, um, 
patterns or uh, long hair mutations. That's really fascinating. <laughs> yeah, so so we collect a lot of data and and uh, yeah, we did the sequencing, whole genome sequencing for a hundred of them. So all these are, are and then also we examine the genetics uh, structure, population genetic structure of Southeast Asian cat in relation to the worldwide cat population. So all wow. these studies are um, are the yeah uh, are all these study are um, yeah part of the uh, domestic cat projects that are going on in the lab. But the the issue is that we accumulate more data. Uh, overwhelmingly uh, more abundant than the speed that we can wrap up and then write out the manuscript. So, <laughs> <That's great. laughs> all this, yeah, this Bietti paper and domestic paper was derived from Dr. Uh, uh, Yu He's uh, PhD thesis uh, back in 2018. So, so yeah, so two years later, we have finally managed to publish it and, and the Southeast Asian cat, the uh, short tail cat uh, paper, uh, project that I just uh, talked about. So yeah, the student um, yeah, uh, graduated like uh, uh, six months ago. So I expect so maybe it will take us another two years to get the data out and publish it. So, so yeah, I, I know that uh, yeah, we're not supposed to release all this unpublished data, but I feel so excited that as you ask uh, uh, from the short tail, so, so I talk about it. So, but I really- So exciting. That, yeah, when we got- Have you come back and talk about it. Yeah, so, so I would li like to really like keep in touch and then the, yeah, through you and you can, you, uh, you can bridge uh, our research to the cat community and then uh, let people know about our passion about the uh, cats. <laughs> so Absolutely. So I actually, um, back from the time that I met Leslie Lyons and uh, Steve O'Brien and, and uh, the Eduardo uh, back at NIH, um, I have been raising Bengal cats. Like, uh, and uh, I actually got a couple of the F1 hybrids from NIH uh, and they made part of my program now 30 years almost. That's how you work with uh, Chris Kalen. That's right. I, Chris <laughs> is the man um, who has helped to keep me both engaged and excited. We meet not only in PAG, in PAG but in Switzerland? Did that's, you go right. that's right. Burn, that's right. right? That's Burn. Right. Yeah, that's where I remember when you say that PAG in, in San Diego, but I, don't, yeah. I remember I, I met you in Bern in 2019. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right, Chris um, he suggested I come along to the, um, the to the cat and dog conference in I think Cambridge was the first one, and then I went to Minneapolis and then Bern, Switzerland, and they've oh. been super exciting uh, to oh. me. And uh -huh. I want to know if uh, during the course of your research, as you look at um, all these interesting domestic cat genomes throughout Asia, have you ever found any history because uh, we found, I've read papers about uh, uh, bones of Asian leopard cats being found in China from archaeological sites 2,000 years ago. Has there ever been any history of uh, an admixture event between domestic cats and Asian leopard cats that exist as part of the domestic cat population? And if you've got a paper coming out that you're going to publish about it, you don't have to tell me. <laughs> 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 oh, that that cat is actually right now in the the sample of that cat that you mentioned, the, the leopard cat uh, that is uh, um, uncovered from the archaeological site in China. Yes. So we got the we got the samples, and then we are so it's a collaboration between us and, um, and Gregor Larson. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's one of his students. Uh, yeah. So that's actually. Um, from the bird meeting, that's the first the cat and dog genome you know, meeting I went, and uh, this is so productive and uh, so interesting. So there, uh, yeah, Larson introduced me, uh, his uh, student, his Chinese student, who is interested in the ancient DNA work of uh, uh, Chinese cats. Uh, 
So the archaeology uh, cat samples, but and since the sample cannot move to out of China, so he need to find a local collaboration in China so that he can carry his lab work. I say, oh, of course, we have the ancient ancient DNA lab in our lab, and then we did the ancient tiger work, and then I have been always interested in the domestic cat history in China. So and I have been interested in that particularly archaeological site uh, cast. So if there's a, uh, um, the, this students already like conducting the work, of course, it will be such a, uh, um, a, a such an honor so that we can, uh, yeah, we can host the project and collaborate on it. So, and due to the, the epidemics, uh, the, the, the pandemic, so he, he, uh, yeah, he ended up, uh, first it was like, uh, he will stay in China for, maybe three months and finished the lab work and I went back to Oxford to continue. And then, but now it's after one year, one and a half year. So he's still in China. And then, wow. so it's still pushing along the collection, sample collection and, uh, and, and the lab work in our lab. So, so, so we are, we are so just yesterday, he told me that that particular sample, that suspicious, su suspicious uh, leopard cat, uh, uh, we got the, the 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 DNA quality was quite good, so we are going to look at the. So I and then immediately I asked him. So is it leopard cat? He said, oh, I don't know yet. I need to look at the the data. So so that, that's another project that I'm um, really exciting too. So that's kind of extension from our our modern cat uh, domestic cat study. Now we enter the, the to the ancient uh, cat uh, uh, studies in China. So he he managed to to collect uh, yeah. 20, 20 uh, ancient cat uh, samples from from 6,000 years ago to 1,000 years ago. So cover different uh, dynasties of China from this archaeological archaeological uh, site. <laughs> so. My mind is blown. <laughs> I, I, I'm interviewing Car uh, Claudio Ottoni in a couple of weeks about some of his um, ancient uh, the DNA, the paleogenomics that he's done in uh, cats from archaeological sites, particularly in Europe and Northern Africa. So to know that the work is going on that will focus or at least include cats from uh, various Chinese dynasties is incredible. I mean, what <laughs> a, uh, an incredible both historic and, and cat and human resource for the future. Good work. Wow, this is like the most fun I've had talking about cats. In <laughs> is there no. <laughs> I just hope that I can uh, get some of the get uh, most of them done done before I retire. <laughs> so there's so, there's so much to do. <laughs> well, you've done so much already. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, there are people like myself. Uh, I went to the Bern meeting in Switzerland uh, in part because the International Cat Association uh, partnered with Wisdom Health, and we screened. A thousand uh, pedigreed cats, Bengals, Persians, Chinese, Abyssinians, um, using their uh, array, their uh, DNA array sequence. And it's really exciting to know that people like you and your students who are finding and discovering new things about cats, some of the things that we rely on to test our cats for diseases and to find out colors, they exist on that array because of you. Uh, and all of those cats, all those thousand cats that we tested in Chica, all were screened for the HES7 um, variant. And so we thank oh. you for uh, being oh. <laughs> <laughs> the tick, uh, The tick genes, you mean? You were yeah. yeah. Oh, we, yeah. That's a that's a fantastic paper. Oh, <laughs> we're, we're very appreciative of you and your students. And is there anything else that uh, you want to share with cat lovers around the world um, before I let you go so you can find out more cool catching? <laughs> well, uh, I've been thinking, uh, yeah, at some point we do need the uh, yeah, the, the support and from the cat community as uh, we have uh, several uh, projects that has been going on, but uh, we we kind of we have major projects, but we have minor projects. Uh, there's something that I've been interested in, but uh, not the uh, very uh, has not been very devoted to to push it. Uh, so, but at some point, uh, I may uh, want to yeah get uh, get get to it. So at that time, so we may need uh, 
um, yeah, we have been getting a great uh, support from the, um, the CAD community. There's, um, there's a website, I don't know if you're aware, uh, Masty Cat. Uh, yeah, that summarizes all these cat co colors. Oh, yes, Masty Beast. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, yeah. So, so the lady like organizing the, the website has given us a lot of help. And so, so at, at some point, uh, I will just uh, love to. Yeah, if we are in need of some, yeah, some particularly samples and some particular knowledge about the cats and in overall, so we we hope that we can get connected to the uh, more to the international cat community and get get the help because all this experience, all the knowledge from the cat community are are all this essential uh, fact that we can base our study on. So wow. I really love to 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 yeah work with the cat, cat community and then so so to get the we got a lot of questions that are derived from the, the people who love cats and have cats and know about cats so and we are geneticists and then although i'm a cat lover myself personally but that's really like uh yeah but we don't we cannot know like a thousand cats and <laughs> all these things so so a lot of things are projects that uh, a few that i can think about so like uh, yeah, the Japanese, uh, the cat, the overall origins of the uh, domestic cat in China, in Japan. So whether how, because all this uh, Japanese, whether the whole um, domestic cats of Japan, do they have a founder effect and they derive from China and the domestic cat uh, history evolution in Southeast Asia. So all these questions that, uh, when we, once we have the first the first stage of study, and then we have a question, and then make us leads us to the more thinking of our the, the cats in the in the local areas, so like the Tibetan cats or so the Tibetan cats. So we can rely on the the communities in China, and then have have the study in China. But there's also a lot of. Uh, uh, cat uh, in interesting re questions related to cats, like the, in Japan, in Southeast Asia. So that's uh, something that we really like to reach out to the cat community and then see how we can uh, uh, get the, uh, use the, like, the citizen science and uh, to know <laughs> about the, the, the cat and to further explore this um, fantastic world of cats. Uh, well, it will be our pleasure and we want to thank you for your time. This fantastic paper that we'll all be excited to read when it's published soon. It was thrilling to see the data presented and the photos are gorgeous. Uh, we all want to visit those beautiful plains in Tibet. Oh, sure, sure. Let's hope that this pandemic then we'll go over soon and let's get back to the normal world. <laughs> Absolutely. And if normal means you'll find more cat chains, we have to let you do that. But I, my, <laughs> my best friend in the world, um, her mom was Jean Mill, who created Bengal cats. But my best friend created a breed called Toygers that look like toy tigers with stripes. And when I told oh. her to talk to you, she Oh, walked... we had the uh, kin, uh, candle-like uh, stripes. Exactly. That's right. Uh, Toygers, look, you do. Oh. You're a messy beast. So yeah. she's, she asked me, have you found the gene for tiger stripes yet? Because she wants to get exact tiger stripes on her Toygers. I said, I don't think so, but I'll ask you. Have you found those yet? <laughs> <laughs> we noticed that the recent paper from uh, Indian about that black tiger, which oh, is yes. not a, it's a, it's a dense uh, arrangement of uh, stripes, uh, yeah, but not entirely how it's a merging of a. Uh, of uh, stripes, not the forming of stripes. But that thing, yeah, you know, my associate, uh, Dr. Xiao Xu. Mm -hmm. So he is the co author with Chris Kalen on that science paper. So and he's also a student of Stephen O'Brien's Marilyn Raymond. So, wow. and then he, he returned to China after his PhD in 2011 and become my associate. So we are colleagues and then we are, we are together in the domestic cat. Uh, research so he he was the leading author publishing the white wow. tiger or and the yes. golden tiger yeah so and the king tail yeah the has seven is his work too so so he 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 that he showed me the candle like uh, um, <laughs> tiger stripe so that's how i know it so, <laughs> yeah, so so we are we are we are great team so so we are we feel like uh, we carry on the uh, Stephen O'Brien's uh, legends uh, into, into into China, and then we are we are get able to 
to to do it all this fantastic work is really our 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 fortune <laughs> well it is our great fortune i will let you go thank you so much for your time and thank i look you. forward to talking to you again at some point thank you so much Anytime. yeah thank you thank bye you bye. for your passion about oh. cats it was a pleasure thank you <laughs> bye bye, bye, -bye.